And thanks, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so here we go. So uh, again, just start off by thanking everybody for showing up, and a big thanks to Andy for uh, for organizing this. So I'm Mark, and tonight I'm going to talk about Zio, a new functional effects system for Scala. So if those words don't mean anything to you right now, then that's fine. You're in the right place. All right. So first off, a little bit about me. So first, I've been doing this for a long time, but honestly, that doesn't really count for much. I'm just an old dog that keep trying to learn new tricks. And then generally what happens is once I've learned something interesting, I seem to end up in front of this group, Case, to, and to talk about it. Uh, so I went back and checked, and if I've counted right, I think this is number eight. Um, so anyway, one of the new things that I've been learning is, is Zio. So that's what I want to talk about today. All right, and a couple quick things about you know, myself and Zio. So first, I'm not a Zio uh, contributor. So everything I'm going to talk about tonight is strictly uh, the perspective of an outsider. Uh, but I am a Zio user. So uh, I've recently had one of those kind of cool one-off standalone projects at work that looked like a really neat fit for trying out Zio. And the project ended up being a success and it's running in production right now. So I at least have a little bit of experience you know, trying to use Zio in the real world. All right, so, so here's my plan uh, uh, for this evening. So I wanna start off by looking at kind of some history and motivation uh, for Zio. Because what I think happens is when people see this for the first time, their initial reaction is kind of, well, why would you do that, right? So I think maybe it'll help to go back and try to answer the question, you know, what problem is Zio trying to solve? And then how did this particular solution come about, right? And then once we've seen that, we'll take a tour of Zio, right? And uh, emphasis on tour. So what I'm gonna try to do is stay very high level, uh, try to get as much breadth as I can so we can see as much that's out there and try not to get bogged down in the weeds. Because the real goal here tonight for me is I wanna to try to get you, inter uh, get you interested. So you have enough information that you can kind of get started and uh, start learning some of this on your own. So that's the plan. So let's get started. So first off, some history. And for this, I'm actually gonna go way back to antiquity, right? So let's go way back to the beginning and let's look at the story of Pandora's box. Okay, so most people are probably familiar with this. So Zeus gave Pandora a box as a wedding gift and said, you know, don't open this. But the Olympian gods had actually created Pandora to be specifically curious, right? So it, she couldn't help it. In the end, the box was gonna be open. And then out came all the evils of the world, right? The things that make us miserable as human beings. So now the moral here is kind of, well, one, uh, Zeus is kind of a prick. Uh, but this is really a, a creation myth that kind of explains that uh, these evil things are kind of on us. So it's up to us to learn how to tame them and handle them to avoid being miserable. Right. But I like to tell my own story uh, a little bit more modern. Right. And I call this von Neumann's box. And spoilers, it's already been opened. Right. So what came out of von Neumann's box? Well, not evils necessarily, but let's call them complexities, right? Things that make our lives as software developers miserable. So things like handling errors, side effects, concurrency. So as soon as we have to interact with the outside world, things get a lot more complicated. There's a lot more ways that things can go wrong. Uh, so what we need to be able to do is write software that's robust in the face of all of these complexities. So, for example, when we do I.O., things might have worked thousands of times in the past, right? And now they fail because a disk filled up. Or we do a side effect, like uh, accessing a real-time clock, right? Now our program's behavior is completely unpredictable. You know, concurrency. We have multiple threads of our application all banging away and interfering with each other, right? That's really, really hard to get right. Now, these are all things that are uh, uh, examples of the more complex, uh, uh, a bigger general concept of computer science called effects, right? But the thing that's really important to realize here is that we cannot escape these things. Right? Running a program with no effects, right? It has no interaction with the outside world or anything else. Doesn't accomplish anything more than warming up the room, right? So all we can do is try to learn how to tame these things, to handle them. Right now, switching back to uh, uh, Pandora's box, you might remember if you know the story that after all those evils got out, Right? The box wasn't empty, right? Left inside the box was hope. Now that's kind of an interesting twist on the story. 
And uh, it's kept commentators uh, busy for millennia trying to figure out what the heck it means, right? Why was hope in a box full of evils? Right? What about von Neumann's box, right? Is there any hope in there? Okay, well, sure. I mean, not even I'm pessimist to think that there isn't any hope, right? So, so what is it? What, what's the analog of, of, of hope in this, in this story? Well, it beats me. Uh, I don't know. I obviously don't have the answer to that question. I don't think anybody else has the answer just yet. All right, and now you probably thought I was leading up to try to stick Zio in there, but yeah, no, that wouldn't be fair. All right, so Zio is this neat new tool, but it's not going to be the solution to all of our problems. Right? But it might just make us a little less miserable. So what about Zio? So Zio is an effect system which means that it's a platform for developing effectful programs you know, that are highly concurrent, robust in the face of errors. It gives us a way of describing our effects like doing IO or allocating resources in a way that helps us do them correctly, right? So that we can recover uh, from errors when things go wrong. All right, so this is the problem that Zio is trying to solve, right? Writing effectful programs. Okay, but to see how we actually, what the actual solution is, we need to make one more historical stop, right? That's in the ancient history of the 1990s. So the 90s were actually a remarkable decade. Their first decade that weren't the 1970s or 80s. So they had that going for it right out of, right out of the gate, right? But a lot of really important technical things actually happened in the 1990s. So the World Wide Web, that kind of ended up being a big thing. Linux is a child of the 90s. And I don't know about everybody else, but if I think back, you know, like important things that happened to me in the 90s, well, doom has to rank right up there towards the top. And then, of course, the, the gorilla in the room is Java. Right? So all of these things changed history. Right? There are things that went bang in the 1990s, and they're still echoing today. Right? But there was something else that happened in the 90s that I think was groundbreaking, uh, maybe even earth, uh, earth shattering. And it's still not going today, but maybe at a frequency that most people aren't really tuned into. And that was Haskell. So I did it. I dropped the H-bomb in a Scala talk. So what about Haskell? So for people who aren't familiar, Haskell began as a research language for studying lazy functional programming. So Back at the time, there were several other functional programmings that used strict evaluation. So laziness was what really set it apart. That was the key thing that Haskell was trying, uh, trying to study. And, and lazy evaluation actually had a profound impact on the language. But one of the things that they found early on, it was kind of unexpected, was that being a lazy language actually forced it to be pure. So it turns out there's just no rigorous way to design a language that's lazy and can do side effects. Well, and that's a pretty serious problem, right? Because we already said you have to be able to do side effects to do anything useful. And for the first several years of its existence, you couldn't write anything useful in Haskell. So that's kind of an embarrassing conundrum. So laziness implies no side effects. We have to have side effects. That's a logical fallacy. And generally, when you're up against logic, it's game over. You can't win. Okay. But wait a minute, we've heard that one before. If you can't win, cheat. Or more generously, change the rules of the game so that success becomes possible. And that's what Phil Wadler and Simon Peyton Jones managed to do. They changed the rules of the game. So what did they do? So they split the world into two parts. All right, the first part is purely functional. This is the Haskell language that we actually write code in. And this language is completely pure, right? We really cannot do side effects. So when we come to this point where we need to have some effect on the world, all we can do is return a value. That's all functions do, they return values. And this value describes the effect that we would like to have on the world. So in Haskell, we don't do side effects, we describe them. Right? And this value that we return uh, that describes this effect is Haskell's IO type. So that says IO of A. So this is the Haskell's uh, type signature. This lowercase a is a type parameter. So we can have like an IO of uh, unit or an IO of int or something like that. So what is this thing? 
uh, this IoT uh, data type. So uh, this is quoting Simon Peyton Jones. A value of type I O of A is an action that when performed may do some input output before delivering a value of type A. All right, so that's a mouthful. What exactly uh, does that mean? There's a couple of things we can pull out of this, I think, that are important. So this action thing is something that will be performed. So it doesn't do anything right now. It's something that in the future, something else will perform for us. And the other thing that's important to, to take out of this is that it's a value, right? It's just a thing. It's a data structure. It's like any other value in Haskell. So we can bind it to variables, we can pass them to functions, we can return them from functions, all the things you would do with any other value in Haskell. So now we can write programs, right, that describe their behavior, these effects, and then we can manipulate and combine these effects to create new effects. And do that again, manipulate, combine, to create ever bigger effects. And we can just keep doing this over and over again till we come up with our top level effect that kind of describes all of our program. And once we have that, we can hand it off to the second part uh, of this puzzle, and that's the runtime. So the runtime is not pure, right? The runtime knows about the outside world. The runtime can actually have side effects, right? So uh, this is what actually performs our actions, right? So we split the world in half. We have a pure part, and then we have an impure part. So that's kind of uh, abstract maybe. So let's let's take a look at a concrete example, right? Which of course has to be hello world. All right, so the first thing to uh, take out of this is that this main function here is not the main entry point of our program. So in most other programming languages, main is where control gets transferred to to start things off. And Haskell main is actually down inside the runtime. So the runtime gets started and it calls our main function and that is gonna pass back the IO, the description of our program. And we can see that here looking at the type. So this says main has type IO of unit. And so we look at what main actually does. It calls this put star line function to, with hello world. Now this put star line function does not cause anything to show up on the console. This can't do any side effects. It returns this IO of unit that describes the act of uh, writing something to the console. And then we're going to return that back to the, the runtime, and then it's actually going to perform that effect. Then the, the output will show up on the console. All right. So this is obviously you know a really, really uh, trivial example. Uh, but it, it really is how every Haskell program works. right? So even if you know whether it's a, a console application, a stream processing tool, a web app, an X Windows window manager, right? They all work the same way. They have a main function that returns an IO of unit that describes the actions of our program, and then they hand it off to the runtime that actually makes those manifest in the real world. All right, so just as an aside, uh, this is actually a really interesting paper uh, written by Simon Peyton Jones that talks about some of this history, how it came about. And it digs into the, the details of how it actually works under the covers in Haskell. Uh, but one of the things I'll point out here, uh, so if we read from the abstract, right, to write real applications, we must grapple with awkward real world issues like input, output, robustness, concurrency. Right? These things sound familiar? So I think it's kind of funny. So I started off comparing these things to Pandoran evils. And Simon Peyton Jones makes them sound like teenagers. Right. But actually, in either case, these are things we have to learn how to handle or we're going to be miserable. All right. So before we move on, this is important. This this is really the key slide. This is the most important thing in this entire presentation, because this is the new idea. Right. Everything that comes after this is really more like implementation details. So what do we have? Well, our programs are values. Right. So these I.O. things. Their, their values. These values describe our program. And then we make larger and larger programs by combining smaller ones together using this, these things called combinators. In all of these things, these combinators and everything else we're working with at this level are pure functions. And then finally, once we've uh, 
put all that together, we hand it off to a runtime to actually perform the actions, right? So that's really what this, uh, this is all about. Okay, so now we can start to answer the question. So what, what is Zio? So Zio is an IO-like construct for Scala, right? So it's based on all of those ideas that were on that last slide. Right? It is completely different, right? It's important to point out that the way Zio works under the covers has nothing at all to do with Haskell's IO, which, you know, makes a, uh, a you know, makes sense because, you know, they're completely different languages. So the other thing Zio brings is a slew of combinators, ways of combining these things together. So we have combinators for sequencing and looping and doing concurrency and handling errors and all kinds of things. And then the last thing here is that Zio provides a highly performant runtime system. Right? And this runtime is based on fibers, which is a type of, of green thread. So we're not running directly on OS level threads, we're running on these fibers. And some neat things about the fibers is one, Right, they're cheap, they're inexpensive to create. Right? So we can make lots of them. So we can have really highly concurrent programs running on these fibers. And another key feature uh, that it turns out to be really, really useful is this idea of interruptibility. So we can actually interrupt these actions while they're running and actually know exactly what it means for that interruption to happen. Right? And then we can guarantee, because we know how this works, that any resources held by these fibers are actually going to be released. So we get, you know, this resource safety is baked in. All right, so now, here we are. We can finally meet Zio. So here it is. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Right, so what is this thing? What's going on here? The first thing you'll notice is Zio has three type parameters. Right? Haskell's IO only had one. So this is because Zio is actually going to be doing a lot more than what Haskell's IO actually does. So let's look at it. What does it do? So a Zio is an action that, when performed, may have some interaction with the world. And then it might succeed with a value of type A. Or it might fail with a value of type E. And then it requires an environment of type R. All right, so let's step back and look at this. So Right off the bat, we can see that Zio actually makes explicit this idea of success and failure. Right? And, uh, and we know exactly you know, uh, what the success and error types actually are. All right? And this environment thing, uh, so you can think about this as being a, a key value map. And the, the keys in this case are actually Scala types. And the associated values are an object of that type. And we can store anything we like inside the environment. Uh, but one of the things that we use it for quite a bit is for storing Zio modules. Right? And these modules are how we actually provide behavior to our programs in Zio. OK, so this is all really abstract still. So we need to look at a concrete example, which is, again, required by law to be Hello World. All right, so the first thing you might notice here, so Hello World in Zio. It is if you squint, it looks quite a bit like the Haskell version. So first off, this app thing here. So this is going to be the main entry point of our program. So app is going to uh, instantiate a, a Zio runtime, provide it with a default environment. Then it's going to call our run method to get our top level description of our application. And then it's going to use the runtime to actually perform it. So now we can see inside our uh, Hello world, we're call, calling put star line again, giving it a, uh, a string. Now again, put star line is not going to cause anything to be uh, displayed on, on the console. It returns an IO that describes what it means to display a string on the console. The runtime is actually gonna do that for us. And now here we meet our first combinator, this exit thing. So, uh, uh, what exit is going to do is transform our success and error of our put star line into basically a POSIX exit code, right? So zero for success, uh, non-zero for uh, uh, for failure. So this actually might make a little bit more sense if we uh, put the type signatures in. Okay, so here we can see that uh, console uh, put star line takes a, a string expression as input. Now this is passed by name, so this expression won't actually be evaluated until this effect is performed. Now, in this case, it's a, a static string, so it doesn't make any difference. 
And then you notice this returns a ZL. And this ZL requires an environment that contains the console module because that's where this put star line behavior comes from. And it succeeds with unit because put star line doesn't return anything of any, uh, any useful value. And the error type is nothing, right? So a, a type, an error type of nothing means uh, essentially this is an IO that can't fail, right? There is no thing of type nothing. So there's no way for put star line to actually generate a failure. Okay, so then if we look back at our, uh, our run method up here, we can see that the, the ZO that gets returned by run, while well, still can't fail, but this unit success type has been turned into a sex, successive um, exit code. So this is what exit code does, is it transforms the success and error types of, um, of this effect. Okay, so again, this is a really, really boring, trivial uh, example. So let's look at one that's just slightly less trivial and boring, but only slightly less. All right, so first, actually, I want to talk about that uh, before we get too much farther. So one of the problems with using these really simple examples is I think people can come away thinking, well, Zio is just this, this little toy for printing strings on the console or something. You know, Obviously, that's not the case. Right. The reason for using these simple examples is just so that I can focus on the structure of how we put things together, how we combine these, these things together. So you can kind of mentally replace anywhere you see any of these console effects. You know, just you know, in your head, say uh, something more interesting, like uh, query a database or open a file or post to a web app, you know, something like that. Nobody actually uses these uh, puts their line effects in real programs. All right, so anyway, in this particular example, I really tried to, uh, to stress the fact that our programs are values. So I've done that by creating our, our main effect here and actually assigning it to a value called program. And you can probably see you know, what's gonna happen here. Right? We use put star line to write a prompt to the console. We read a string from the console and then we format a new string and, and print it back out. And then the overall result is just a uh, unit. But something else, something interesting has happened here now. You'll notice that this program can now fail with IO exception. Right? And that's because get star line can fail with IO exception, right? So for example, if you read uh, into file. And what's interesting here, what's really kind of cool is this uh, type annotation here, I could have actually left it off, right? The compiler will actually be able to infer this exact type. So just by combining these things together, the, the compiler knows that this is an effect that has to have a console because all of these things require an environment with console. And it knows that this is an, uh, an effect that can fail with IO exception because it contains get star line. So even though it's buried down here inside the middle, right, this uh, failure type has bubbled up all the way to the outside. So, and this is actually something that we'll see quite a bit is that um, uh, almost everything in, in Zio uh, uh, type reference works uh, just right out of the gate. All right, so now let's take a look at, at this exit code thing again. So what we can see here is that what exit code does is it transforms you know, an IO that can succeed or fail into an IO that can't fail, but will always succeed with an exit code. And now our success or failure is now represented by the value of exit code. All right, so now we can actually step back and answer this question like, what is a combinator? I've been throwing this term around for a while, so now we can actually say what it really is. So a ZO combinator is a function that takes one or more of these IOs as input and returns a new IO. So for example, exit code takes one input, which is you know the this reference uh, for program, and returns a new IO whose uh, success and error values have been have been changed. And this for comp uh, compression uh, comprehension up here, that's also a combinator. Four comprehensions are just syntactic sugar for flat map and map. So this is just a, a set of nested flat maps and maps. And it's, that's, it's a combinator that takes several IOs and creates a new one whose overall effect is what we get by combining these things together. All right, so now we've got a program that can fail. So let's take a look at some of the ways that we can handle errors. All right, so here's a simple one. This is the exact same program that I had on the previous slide. The only difference here is we've added this catch-all combinator. 
Now, first, a quick word about this name. Uh, this kind of makes it sound like we're throwing and catching exceptions, and, and that's not the case at all. So we don't ever throw exceptions inside Zio, right? Pure functions are not allowed to throw exceptions. And plus, our error types can be anything, right? Not necessarily throwables. So I think this would better be called something like, you know, recover all or something like that. But this is the name we have. And so what this combinator does is if the original uh, I.O. succeeds, it doesn't do anything. The success just flows straight through. If it fails, this catch all has a handler, which is a function from our error type to a new I.O. So what's going to happen is the runtime will uh, call this uh, handler function with the error and it's going to return a new I.O which might also succeed or fail. So then in this example, all I'm doing is I'm just gonna print a message out to the screen. So we're gonna use this put star line to, to print to the console. Uh, we'll come back and talk about this combinator in a minute, but the results of this is we're gonna print a, a new line and then print this error message. And because we know put star line can't fail, this, the uh, IO returned by this, this handler can't fail. So this, this catch all actually does recover from any error that this program might throw. All right, so uh, let's look at some more combinators. So again, here's our same main program, but I've added a couple new things here. First off is this forever combinator. And you can kind of see by the types uh, that I put in here, uh, it's kind of interesting. So this takes a, an IO that can succeed or fail and returns a new IO that can never succeed, right? So the uh, success type is nothing. Right? And that's because if the original I.O. succeeds, Forever just loops back and does it again, over and over and over again. So there's no way that Forever can ever actually succeed. But it can't fail. So Forever is basically an infinite loop that keeps running until uh, this I.O. Uh, causes an error. And then we've changed catch all to be catch sum. So this takes a partial function. So if uh, the actual exception type matches uh, this uh, case expression, expression. So if it's specifically an end of file as opposed to any other IO exception, well, we want to treat that as, as success. That's just the way we're going to exit from our main loop, right? So all we do here, we're going to uh, succeed with just printing out, uh, uh, you know, goodbye, and then we're just going to exit normally. But if program uh, failed with any other uh, IO exception type, well, that's still an error. So what's going to happen here is that will be uncaught. So the result of exit code is just going to say, hey, this didn't work. Now, we could obviously add some more uh, error, uh, error correction or error detection stuff here as well. But, you know, in this example, we're just going to fail. All right. So uh, that's a couple of ways to, uh, uh, to handle errors. I'll just throw a few more up here on the screen. Uh, there are lots more. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. Uh, or else it's just a fallback. So if A succeeds, fine. If not, try this one. Map error just maps a function over the error type so we, you know, we can change the type of the error. Uh, either is kind of interesting. So either takes an IO that can, you know, can succeed or fail and then turns that into an IO that always succeeds, but the successor error are now built into the success cha channel uh, in either. So a failure would turn into a success with a left of E and, and success would end up with a right of A. And eventually, oh, this is kind of neat. So eventually it's just something that uh, loops over errors until we actually succeed. So this will just over and over again, re retry an IO until it actually succeeds. Okay, so we've seen some ways to handle errors. So now let's kind of take a tour of a few more of the, uh, the combinators we have. And actually, before I uh, go to the next slide, I'm going to apologize. Uh, the next couple of these slides are, are kind of busy. I, I decided to go ahead and leave all of the type annotations in, but um, uh, you know, just try to ignore them uh, if they get uh, if they're too much. All right. So let's look at this uh, combinator. This is called Zip. So Zip is a combinator that that takes two IOs as input. Right. So it's going to um, uh, create a new I.O. whose result is to first perform A, then perform B, and then take those two success values up and combine them together in a tuple. So the net result of this is going to be a success of a string in an int. So do one, 
then do the other, and then combine the results uh, into a tuple. And you can see up here these examples that I put up here just uh, you know has the effect of printing to the string or a string to the console. And then this as combinator just throws away the success value and replaces it with a constant. So this is going to be something that succeeds with a string. This is going to succeed with an end. Uh, and I've thrown in a, a failure here. So this is just a way to construct an I.O. that is always going to fail. So this will fail with a string. All right. So again, so it's going to perform A, then it's going to perform B, and then it's going to combine the results. Uh, these two variations. Uh, just uh, discard one or the other success values. So in this first case, we're going to perform A, then perform B strictly for its side effects because we're going to discard its success value and just return the success of A. And then this is just the flip side. So what about failure? So in this example, we're going to perform A, which succeeds. Then we're going to perform F, which is going to fail. So if either one of these fails, the overall result of this new I.O. is a failure whose type in this case is string. So in this case, we performed A, then performed F, which failed. Now in the second case, we're going to perform F, which fails right away, which means B is never performed. OK, so this is a really simple combinator. It actually shows up all uh, in all kinds of places. It's really useful. And one of the important things to take away from this is that we know exactly what this combinator does with failure, right? We know in this case, B is never going to be uh, performed. All right, the next one I'm going to show uh, is similar. So we're just replacing the star with an ampersand. So this is zip par, right? a parallel zip. So what this is going to do, same sort of thing, but now we're going to perform A and B concurrently. So Zio is going to put A on one fiber. It's going to put B on another fiber. They're going to be run at the same time. They may uh, run in different orders. Uh, they may uh, uh, succeed or or, um, or fail in different orders. But once they've both succeeded, we'll get back the same kind of type. We'll get back a success, which is a tuple of their uh, success values. And again, these, these two variants just discard one or the other uh, success values. So failure now is a little bit different in this concurrent uh, uh, way of doing things. So uh, this is going to run A and F concurrently at the same time. right? It's going to see, at some point, F fails. So once it sees a failure, it knows that this whole uh, I.O. is going to end up in failure. So what it does, as soon as it realizes that this is going to be a failure, it wants to. It doesn't need to finish A. Right? It already knows it's going to discard the value that A succeeds with. So what it does is it actually interrupts A. It stops A being performed. And then the result here is just going to be failure. And the same thing with this, um, uh, with this other one. Both of these are going to run uh, concurrently. And as soon as it decides that this whole uh, I.O. is going to be a failure, it interrupts the other one. And then what that means is any resources that uh, that other I.O. Had, had acquired are going to be released. And we won't actually return from this new I.O. until all of those resources have been released. So again, the important thing to take away from this is that we know what these, this combinator does, and we know exactly what happens in the event of failure. Now, one other thing I'll mention here, just kind of as an aside, you know, if I flip back and forth between here, you may have noticed this. The types don't change at all. Right? So even though this is sequential, and that's parallel. So it's interesting here. All we know when we have something of, of type Zio is that it's a thing that might interact with the world and then succeed or fail in some way. We don't actually know the semantics or what it actually, what these things actually do. And that is, this is a, the same limitation that Haskell has. Uh, and if you uh, go out and look at the literature, this is one of the things that uh, that uh, people are studying is well, how can we enhance type systems to give us more information about these effects? You know, the range that um, uh, that this effect has, and you know what its action is. So anyway, I just think that's kind of interesting. All right, so we've seen a little bit of concurrency, so let's try and look a little bit more. All right, so we can race two IOs together. So again, this is something that's going to run these two effects concurrently. A and B will run at the same time. But the meaning of race is different than the zip par. Race says, 
I want the first success value. So run A and B together, whichever one succeeds first, that's the winner, that's the success value. Uh, if the other one failed or uh, just you know didn't finish fast enough, uh, we're gonna discard its result. So um, uh, this first one is just gonna race uh, two of these things together. Uh, race all is just a way to race several IOs together. Again, all these things are gonna be performed concurrently and whichever one succeeds first uh, wins. And here you can notice I've mixed failure into this. So unlike the zip case where if something fails, the whole thing fails, well, that failure just gets ignored, right? We're looking for the first thing to succeed. Right? And then race either at the end, uh, and these first two, there's no way to tell which one won, right? You just know somebody did. Uh, in this case, we get back an either that tells us uh, whether the left or right one was the one that uh, that succeed, that that finished first. And again, uh, in all of these cases, oh, and I should, I should say that uh, uh, whichever ones don't win, uh, any of those that have not, it, haven't completed yet will end up being interrupted. So if A wins, these two are going to end up being interrupted if they haven't completed shortly after A. And again, this whole new I.O. that gets, comes out of here does not actually complete until all of those fibers have been cleaned up and all of their resources have been released. All right, so this is actually really useful in writing concurrent programs because I don't have to worry about, oh, I started all these things, uh, do I have to worry if that one's still running out there that you know, I, I have to wait for it to finish to, to, uh, to move forward? No, Zio actually guarantees that with, when this returns, all of those fibers have been cleaned up and all of those resources have been released. Okay. Uh, so let's kind of shift gears a little bit. So, so far we've been looking at some of these combinators and we've only been using these built-in um, uh, effects. So let's look at how we can go about you know, creating our own effects. How do we get our own side affecting code kind of lifted up inside of these IOs? The easiest one is just calling this effect. So this is on Zio's uh, companion object. So this just takes uh, some Scala code and again, it gets called by name, so that's not actually going to be uh, performed until we perform this uh, the, the the generated I/O. Right? And what this effect returns is something called task of A. So this is the first time we've seen one of these uh, type aliases. So it it turns out that typing zio followed by uh, uh, three types gets really old after a while, and it makes things not fit on slides very well. Uh, so it defines a bunch of useful uh, type aliases. So task is a type that doesn't need anything in its environment. It fails with a throwable and succeeds with an A. So we can see up here that uh, uh, source.from file is a thing that returns a, a buffered source, or it might fail with a, an exception. Right? So what ends up happening is when we perform this, Zio wraps it inside a try-catch block. So it'll catch any throwable and turn that into a failure or we'll succeed with this buffered source and we get back success. So this is a really way to just start lifting side affecting code up into uh, IO objects. Uh, another related one is effects total. So we can use this in places where we know for sure that this side affecting thing can't fail. So logging a static string is something that's not gonna fail. So we can see here, you know, again, we take this uh, side affecting code uh, expression uh, call by name uh, the result type here is this UIO, which you can think of as being like unfailing IO. So again, you can see that the error type is nothing. So this is a thing that can't fail, right? Which being a, a total expression, it, it better not fail. Another way we can do this is a, a constructor called from either. So this just like you would expect, takes an expression that evaluates to an either and turns a left into a failure and a right into success. So, you know, here's a basic uh, uh, HTTP uh, library. It's gonna query a database, uh, try to get its body, and then it fails with an either of, of two strings where a right is the, the text of the body or a left is the, um, uh, the error message. So when we run this, we'll end up with uh, an IO of ENA. So IO is a, a type alias for uh, just an IO that can fail with an E or succeed with an A. 
and there are lots of others. So you can have, you know, from option, from try, from future. There's, there's all kinds of different ways that we can start lifting our site affecting code up into these ZOs. The last one I'm going to look at uh, is slightly different. So this is a blocking effect. So it's really important when we're writing this concurrent code that we, we know the difference between an effect that can block and effect that can't. Because when we uh, actually perform these blocking effects, we have to make sure that they actually end up on a thread pool that, uh, that we can keep growing, right? Because if we end up with all of our underlying threads blocked on IOs, then we won't be able to make any progress. So we use this blocking uh, module to, to mark these effects as being uh, uh, blocking. So you can think this example, you know, think of it as like a Kafka poll. So it's gonna you know, go out and try to read some data, uh, block for up to 60 seconds if there's nothing there, right? So again, you can see, so here's our effect, uh, you know, which returns you know, something of type A, in this case, you know, consumer records. But if this thing is blocked and we need to be able to interrupt things, uh, Zio doesn't have any idea how to interrupt, it doesn't know what's going on inside this IO. It has no idea how to interrupt this, uh, uh, this consumer poll. So uh, this constructor, effect blocking cancelable, takes a second parameter list, which is an IO that when it is performed, knows how to wake up the, uh, the main uh, IO. So this is just calling consumer wake up. So that's a thing that note will wake up a blocked uh, poll. And then once we come out of that poll, then this uh, fiber can actually be, uh, be interrupted and all of its resources uh, get released. And there are lots of other ways of, of creating these uh, uh, blocking IOs. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit again. So we've seen how to we can start lifting our own code up uh, into these IOs. So let's look at some more combinators, how we can start building up uh, more interesting programs. So repeat is obviously something we want to do. These are essentially loops, right? Uh, while loops or um, a counted loop or something like that. So th these aren't, um, you know, terribly, uh, terribly interesting. But what I will point out is there are a couple of them here you know, that have this M suffix. So the other ones, these all take pure functions. So this predicate is a pure function. But the ones with the M suffix, they're monadic, uh, take a function that takes a success value and returns a new IO. So now this thing that decides whether we succeed or fail you know, is itself a thing that might go out and interact with the world or look at the environment to decide whether or not uh, to repeat or not. So you can start to see that we can start nesting these things together to create you know, much more interesting uh, structures. So while we're thinking about repeat, so we've seen these two before, forever and eventually. Uh, one of the interesting things to point out here is that they're kind of mirror images, flip uh, sides of each other. Forever is a thing that consumes success and keeps going until we get an error. Eventually is a thing that consumes error and keeps going until we succeed. But these are pretty uh, pretty blunt instruments, right? We don't have any control over you know how quickly uh, uh, they they go. We can't stop them, uh, you know, if we decide we're done. So Zio provides a little richer uh, way of doing this type of thing, which is repeat and retry. So the thing here is that now these take this thing called a schedule. So the schedule is what's going to help us decide, uh, should we keep repeating or, uh, or stop? Uh, and if we should repeat, how long should we delay between this one and the next one? So that's what schedule does, is every time we look at it, it answers two questions. Should I recur? And if so, how long should I wait? And you'll notice looking at the types that repeat takes the input of the success type. So uh, when we repeat, we consume our successes to decide whether or not we should repeat. When we retry, we consume the errors to decide whether or not uh, we should recur. So it's really kind of interesting that both repeat and retry, we can use the exact same underlying schedule mechanics uh, to make these things happen, even though repeat and retry are completely different operations. Okay, uh, that's actually what I just said. So how do we use these things? How do we make these? So the first thing we have are a set of um, primitive schedules. 
right? Some really primitive, like once and forever. Those are you know, pretty basic schedules. Uh, then we have some recurrence things here. So we can recur a number of times or based on a predicate. There are lots more of uh, these types of things. Uh, but you'll notice that all of these answer the question of should I recur, yes or no, but don't mention anything about delay. So all of these answer zero for the delay. They'll re uh, recur immediately. And then these last ones, so we have a couple of, you know, fixed in space. So these run on kind of fixed intervals. So fixed will go, you know, once a second, once every minute, something like that. Uh, space is similar, but it just puts a uh, fixed amount of space between the end of one and the beginning of the next. But so these things run at basically uh, constant rates. These last two are kind of back off schedules. So exponential is just going to do like an exponential back off. So it starts at some delay and then doubles that every time. Uh, linear is similar, only instead of uh, doubling, it just multiplies. So you'll get one second, two, three, four, and so on. So you notice these last four answer the question of delay. How long should I, I wait? But don't say anything about uh, recur or not. All of these return yes for recur. Okay, so we've seen some of these primitives. Uh, obviously, by themselves, are not terribly useful. So how do we actually use these you know, to, to do useful things? And we do them with combinators. So this is another time that we're using combinators to start taking simple things and build them up into more complex. So this is a really simple schedule. So it uses this, uh, this is called the intersection combinator. So it's gonna create a schedule that runs at fixed intervals at one minute, and then go for 10 times and then stop, right? So this and here, this intersection will answer, uh, will continue, will recur only if both of these say yes. Right, so this only says, or this says yes always at 60 second intervals. This one only says yes for 10 times. So this is something that will actually recur 10 times at one minute intervals. So here's another one. We can use this exponential back off. We're gonna start at half a second, then one, then two, then four, and so on. And that will keep going forever, keep growing, and keep doubling uh, forever. But here we're using the union combinator. So this will say, continue uh, recurring as long as either one of these say yes. And if both of them have a delay, then take the one that's smaller. So in this case, this is gonna keep growing forever and ever and ever, but as soon as it gets to be longer than one minute, this is gonna be the shorter one. So this gives us an exponential back off with a, with a limit. So it will grow until it gets up to one minute, and then it'll be one minute uh, forever after that. And neither one of these answer no to recur. So this is gonna be a schedule that would run forever. So let's take that same schedule. We don't want it to run forever. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, just for fun, we'll add this jittered combinator. So that adds some randomness uh, to these things. And then we're gonna use the intersection combinator to limit this to you know, 100 uh, iterations. So you can start to see how we can start building up more and more uh, you know, interesting uh, schedules. And just a really simple one to finish up, right? We have one schedule, we run it till it finishes, and then we do another one. So we could actually uh, probably spend an hour talking about all the different ways that you can build up, you know, really interesting, complicated uh, uh, schedules. So the thing to kind of take away from this is just how powerful this, this combinator uh, way of doing things is. Okay, shift gears again. So again, this is gonna be a high level. We wanna to try to see as much as we can. So the next thing I wanna look at uh, is going back to a little bit more of this concurrency stuff and how we can kind of control it ourselves, right? So the way we do this is with combinators called fork and join. So this is kind of, you can think of it as the, the spine for a, a, a server application. So we've got these three things. So status reporter, imagine it's this thing that you know periodically spits out some data that lets things know how we're doing. Uh, we might want to have an HTTP server in our app so that you know people can query us uh, uh, to get data. And then maybe we have some sort of data loop, right? So something that's uh, you know fetching and processing data. And we want all three of these things to be running at the same time, to be running concurrently. And this is a server app, so we really expect these things are going to run forever. So the only time we would ever actually expect these things to, to stop is you know, if there is an error 
if one of them fail for some reason, or if we're interrupted. So what Fork is going to do here is, is we're going to uh, take the I.O. for the status reporter, call Fork. That ends up being uh, an I.O. that returns a fiber. And so we just save off that fiber. The same thing for our HTTP server. We get the fiber for that. And uh, same thing for our, our data loop. So now we have these three operations running concurrently, and we have the fibers that they're associated with. And then what we want to do is just, just wait. We want to just let these things run forever or until one of them fails or we get interrupted. And that's what join all does. So we've just given it, okay, here's all our fibers. Uh, join all will return when all three of these have succeeded or one of them fails. And that's really what we want, right? Wait till these things succeed, which we don't expect to ever happen, or one of them fails, in which case we can exit. Now, one of the neat things we get uh, by running inside the standard app that uh, Zio provides is that it automatically uh, registers a JVM shutdown hook. So when that hook uh, activates, it will automatically interrupt our main thread. So what that's going to do is cause all of our child fibers to be uh, interrupted. So they're going to all shut down, release all of their uh, uh all of their resources, and once all of these things are shut down, once all of our resources have been released, then this is going to exit. So you could run this as a console app and do you know, like a control C, and it will clean up everything uh, just fine. Or run it in something like uh, you know, a container in Kubernetes and would get a SIG term, and everything will clean up and shut down nicely. All right. So this is really important for writing these concurrent programs, is that you know we know when these things shut down that we're guaranteed to uh, release these resources. All right, so talking about that, well, how do we guarantee that we release these things? So one of the ways we do that in Zio is with this thing called bracket. So this looks uh, a little uh, a little busy maybe, but there's three pieces that go into a bracket. There's an acquisition, there's a use, and there's a release. So in this example, this first uh, parameter list is the acquisition. So just pretend that data uh, source is something that you know we can acquire uh, in an IO. So think of it as maybe being, you know, a, a Kafka consumer or something like that. If that IO succeeds, if we actually acquire the data source, then we were, will start processing the main thing here. This is the use IO. So here we get the source that we just acquired and we can start doing stuff with it. So here we just have a loop that's going to repeat forever. So we use this source to go fetch some data, we uh, use that data to make some widgets, and now we want to publish that. So we've got this I/O that's going to publish these widgets. And again, if you want to think about this being a you know a Kafka type of thing, so we want to uh, once we've processed these things, we want to you know tell this data source, okay, commit. I've I've gone uh, processed up through this uh, message. Don't send me it again. So here we're using this zip combinator. So we want to publish the widgets, and if that succeeds, we want to commit them but we don't care about the, the result that comes out of commit. Right? We just want whatever we might have gotten from publish. But there's an important thing here. Right? If we get interrupted while we're doing this, right? so if we get interrupted and we've published the widgets, but we haven't committed yet, then that's a problem. Because now if we uh, restart, we'll get the same data again. So what we do here is we take this new IO that we got back from the zip uh, combinator, and we use the uninterruptible combinator. And that says, this is an IO which cannot be interrupted. So if the interruption happens while we're in here, it'll just be deferred. And once these things finish, then the fiber can be interrupted and then we can get cleaned up. And what does clean up mean? Well, that means we call this release IO. So if the acquire succeeded, we're guaranteed to start using the use uh, IO and then Whatever happens inside the use IO, whether we succeed successfully, we fail for some error, we get interrupted, whatever, we're guaranteed that the close IO or the release IO is going to be performed. And in this case, all we do is close down that source. And one thing to notice here, uh, the release uh, IO here is not allowed to fail. Right? There's, there's no way that you could uh, to do anything with that failure if it happened in there. So we're, here I'm just using this ignore combinator to throw away 
uh, the failure. It's not what you'd probably do in, in the real world. You'd want to, you know, catch it and log it. But, you know, this is Slideware and it let me throw one more uh, combinator up there. Okay, so this is one example of how we, you know, can acquire release, uh, acquire resources and be guaranteed that we can release them no matter what happens. Okay, uh, a couple more things. And the rest of this, I'm going to kind of uh, you know, try to breeze through a little bit faster. Uh, so we, we've, we've seen these modules, that things like, you know, console and blocking and things like that. But we need to be able to make our own. We need to be able to, you know, get our own behaviors uh, that we can make in our, our programs. So we do that uh, by making our own modules. And I'm, I'm only going to hit a couple of high points here because actually most of this is kind of boilerplate. Uh, it's just kind of fiddly details. So we'll just kind of hit the important parts. So there's a module object. You know, you can think of that being analogous to console that we imported earlier. Uh, we have a service trait. Uh, it doesn't have to be called service. That's the convention. This, this trait defines the interface that this is going to expose. And then the, the key thing we have to do is to get an implementation of that trait and then make it available in a layer. These layers are, are how Zio combines together all of these modules. So that's kind of the important thing that comes out of here is this layer. Uh, by convention, the main one is called live. Uh, so this is the one you would use in all of your, your normal programs. All right, but again, this we're just implementing a trait. So you would probably also want to create some testing versions, right? So you might have one that's a mock or one that's a fake or one that uh, you know has some other testing code in it. All right, but they all implement the same interface. And then the last thing to talk about here, so this is how we uh, actually dip into our environment and get access to these things that are in there. So we're going to end up with an environment that has this module in it. And so we use this access uh, method on Zio. So this, this parameter here is the environment. We call get to pull something out. And based on the types, we know the thing we're pulling out has type module, right? Because these things that go into the environment are keyed on Scala types. And then once we have uh, that module out, we can just call do something on it. So we actually invoke uh, the method in our uh, in our module. So you can think about this do something thing here as being analogous to like that put star line that we saw before. And again, it's using this environment to be able to make this module available to all of the effects in our program. Okay, uh, so how do we use this? Well, it's another combinator library. So all of these things are layers and we have combinators for doing what's called horizontal composition or vertical composition. Horizontal just means we're making a new layer that just contains each one of these things. They don't have any relation to each other. It's just, you know, a bag that has these modules. This is vertical composition. This just says module three needs a module two in order to be uh, constructed. So that's vertical. So we need a module two, then we can give it to module three and we get back a new layer that has the, the, uh, you know, the behaviors of module three. And then to, to use this, you know, we use this provide layer, which is how we take this environment that we just constructed and pass it to our program. Now, some important things here is that, uh, you know, we talked about uh, type inference earlier. So the compiler knows, even if we haven't told it explicitly, what modules it has to have inside its environment. And if we give it an environment that is missing something, that it won't compile. Right. So this idea of, of building up these modules, kind of like our uh, dependency injection type thing. So these are things that can be effectful, right? They may need to access uh, uh, external resources. You know, they might succeed or fail. So we do all this stuff to build them up. And if we miss one, right, the, the, we won't compile. So we don't have to wait to run time to determine that, you know, this config file over here didn't have the right class name or something like this. You know, so our configuration is code. Uh, and the compiler will tell us if we if we mess something up. So that's that's really useful. Uh, all right, so uh, moving on again, some things I'm just going to kind of blow through really quickly. Zio provides some really high level concurrency tools. So this ref is is basically a way to model mutable state, right? In a way that's uh, safe between fibers, so we can pass this data, access it between fibers uh, in a safe way. 
The other thing that's really cool is uh, Zio provides an implementation of software transactional memory. So this is something I actually gave a talk on this a few years back. So it, it's really neat. It uses um, things like uh, a uh, database transaction so that we can uh, uh, access these things in a way that's safe across multiple fire, uh, fibers without doing a lot of blocking. So we can detect when something has, has gotten out of whack and start retrying operations. And all these things you know, fit in really well with the IO model because these are all different types of effects. So they're, they're modeled as IOs in, in Zio. Okay, and the last thing I just wanna mention here is interoperability. So Zio is not the only effect system uh, for Scala. So Cat's Effect and Monix are uh, uh, other major projects out there. But what's really neat is that because they're all working with the same kind of general uh, traits and interfaces, that it's not hard to actually get them to work together. So for example, the, the program I worked on, I use HTTP4S to create a, a web server. I use Doobie for uh, database access. And both of those things are actually implemented on top of Cat's Effect. And using the uh, Cat's Effect uh, uh, interop library, I can actually bring those things inside Zio. So for example, the tasks that would normally run in, in cat's effect for HTTP for us to, to handle your HTTP requests are actually now running in Zio tasks on Zio fibers. And it just works. Uh, Doobie has the, the effects that it runs to actually access uh, the database now get turned into Zio tasks that run on Zio fibers. And it just works. Uh, it's, it's actually a tremendous win for the community that we can have these various different ways of, of doing these things and still share them and, and use them together. And there's a bunch of other interop, uh, for example, um, Java concurrency primitives, reactive streams. There, there's lots of these interop libraries. So uh, you know, this is, I, I just think this is, this is really, really uh, a nice thing. Okay, deep breath, we made it to the end. Okay, so now that we're here, so we've had our history lesson, we've taken a tour of zero, hopefully you found some of that interesting. But when we get to the end here, you know, I think we have to ask the question, right? why, right? Why should we do this? So Haskell didn't have a choice, right? Haskell had to invent the IO type or something like it in order to be able to make useful programs, right? But Scala has been able to do side effects from the beginning. Right? Scala doesn't need an IO type in order to write effectful programs. Right? So why should we make this effort to go wrap up all our side effecting code inside these IO values? What are we really getting for it? So I, I think one of the biggest things we get is it makes it easier to create uh, and faster to create these correct programs, right? correctness. Right? So when we're working with these IO values, Right, we're actually at kind of a higher level of abstraction. So it's more, you know, think software construction as opposed to you know, programming. So these IO values, they're descriptions of what our program should do. So they're kind of like little specifications. Right? And now we have all the benefits of programming, of functional programming with immutable data and a strong type system at the level of program construction. Right? So it's easier to reason about how our programs are put together. You know, understand what they do just by looking at them. So we have you know, pure functions, types, parametricity, all the things that we've come to appreciate as part of just writing our Scala code, right? But now at the level of constructing our programs, these types you know, direct us towards the correct programs and away from the wrong ones. Right? And Zio's runtime is actually uh, a really important thing. Oh, actually, I, let me stop and, and go back a little bit. So we're talking about the types, right? So, uh, so th yeah, think about Zio's success and error type. Right? So say I've combined together some IOs and, and I end up with one that uh, doesn't have an error anymore. So now I know that this is an IO whose all of its potential errors have been handled. If I get an IO that still has an error type, well, now I, owe, I know exactly how it might still fail, right? And if I try to use that in a place that's not allowed to fail, then the compiler is gonna prevent me from even constructing, right? That obviously flawed program. And these combinators, right? So say I start off with, with two IOs 
and I understand what each one of them does, and I, I know that they're correct, and I have a combinator that I know what this combinator does, and so I put these things together. Well, so now I have a new I.O., and I know exactly what it does, and I know that it's correct. Right? So these combinators help us build programs that are correct by construction. Right? So moving on to the runtime. So the, the, this runtime is really important. Right? Fibers perform a lot better than operating system threads just because we don't have the overhead of context switching. Right? But even more than that, because the runtime actually controls these fibers, right, we know exactly what's going to happen in the events of errors and interruptions. So that lets us uh, make really strong guarantees about you know, things like resource safety, right, which is really important as we're trying to, to build these uh, highly concurrent, correct programs. Okay, and so to me, I mean, I think th these things are really important. This uh, helping us to build these uh, correct programs in the face of all of these complexities. All right, so to me, that makes it worth the, the cost of entry. Right, but what is that? I mean, nothing is perfect, right? There's, there, there are downsides to everything. So what are the things we have to kind of weigh uh, uh, as we try to you know, make the decision, should we do this or not? Well, obviously, Zio is new and different, so there's going to be a learning curve. Okay? I don't think it's that difficult to learn, but you, know, you are going to have to spend a little bit of time and effort to really uh, you know, kind of come up to speed. Right. And Zio requires discipline. Right? Haskell can't do effects outside of its IO type, right? But Scala can. So to get the value from Zio, you know, we have to, you know, commit to not cutting corners to letting effectful code escape out of these IOs. So, right, so everybody has to be on board and understand how to how to use this, or, or the value just kind of vanishes. And maybe the biggest thing that we have to figure out is, you know, well, how do we migrate there? What about all the code that we already have? How do we get from from here to there? So there are some things we can do. Uh, so you don't have to write the entire application in Zio. Uh, so we can write, say, just a portion of the application that uses these I.O. types. And then we can just get Zio's runtime and use that to perform you know, this part of the application. And then you could, say, bury that behind a function. So the rest of the program doesn't even necessarily need to, to know or interact with Zio. You know, that's just, you know, that's over here. Uh, so it, it might be just the fact, well, everybody said, that part of the program seems to work better. I, what, I wonder what's going on, right? But again, that, that's going to be something that we have to weigh. All right, so uh, that's the story, right? Zio gives us these, these tools to create correct, performant, effectful programs, right? And I, I hope that this talk has kind of given you, you know, some useful information that can help you go out, you know, and get started exploring it, right? And that last word is important, exploring, right? We need to keep exploring these new ideas, these different ways of doing things, right? Because if we're ever going to make software de development better, less miserable, right? We have to explore these new things. So let's go exploring. So, uh, Thank you uh, for all uh, your attention. Uh, I'll try to answer some questions now, uh, if anybody has any. And if anybody's at all curious, I actually have uh, a project here on this computer that uh, uh, show a lot of the things that were already on the screen uh, before uh, we can actually try to run them, just to, if you're curious. So uh, ask away. I'll see, I'll see if I can answer anything. That was fantastic, Mark. Oh, thank you. Really, really well done. Um, question, now that you've got your hands on it a little bit in like a production type setting, curious about all these combinators. They're not, from what I've heard, they're not driven by like implicit imports or stuff, anything like that. They're all just like hanging off the main Zio object, like pretty discoverable as far as that goes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, one of the things that I really like um, uh, for discoverability is it really pays benefits just to actually sit down and, and look through the, the Scala doc. Because uh, all these things are, are just there. And so you just kind of wonder, you know, okay, wonder what that does. Uh, and the other thing that's really cool, uh, you know, obviously it's open source, you know, just go, you know, clone the repo and, and take a look at it. So if you're curious about, okay, well, what does this thing do? Well, it turns out that most of Zio is actually written in Zio. So just go look at, you know, uh, the source code and see, you know, where did this get used? What did, what does it do? Uh, and actually, it, if you go back to that slide on um, uh, how you make a module, which again is just boilerplate hell, 
Um, but uh, there, there are, um, you know, obviously tutorials and things out there about how to do this. Uh, what I thought was the most useful was just go look at the console module, right? Just, you know, it's the, it's the same thing. It's not doing anything special. So just go look at console or clock and see how they work. And to me, that was a, a neat way to actually you know, you know, learn new things. Oh, oh, look at that. They did that. So that's neat to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that schedule composition part of your presentation was really awesome, too. It's mind-blowing. It's amazing. Uh, I, th this, this whole idea of combinators. So, I mean, it's been around for a long, long time. Um, uh, I mean, uh, at least back into the, the late 60s, early 70s, I think, uh, you know, people started talking about, you know, combining, combining forms and things like that. Uh, just the power is amazing. So, I mean, we have... You know, Haskell has always had things like, you know, function uh, combinators. Uh, parser combinators have been a thing forever. I, I did a talk years ago on uh, Parsec, which is a parser combinator library for, for Scala. Yeah, these things are just incredibly powerful. Yeah, so uh, anything else? How have your coworkers taken to your... <laughs> little uh, your project that you do. Oh, uh, don't know what any of them know about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's interesting. So, I mean, um, you know, I, I will say that, um, you know, if uh, if your colleagues already look at you funny because you do Scala, uh, you, you show them uh, Zio for the first time and, and they'll think you've gone off the deep end. Uh, you know, but, but hopefully some of the stuff today gives you some, uh, you know, some way to kind of answer, answer that. So. Uh, were you able to see any like performance benefits? Um, I know that Zio talks about that a lot about how their fibers are so much more performant than like futures per se. Yeah, I, I don't have any hard data on that. Uh, all I can say is that. Uh, uh, the code I'm working on, uh, you know, that I did, I mean, it does, uh, uh, Kafka showed up in these examples quite a bit because it is, what I did was actually a, a Kafka processing tool. Uh, and it chews through uh, a lot of data. It has not had any any issues at all. So I don't have any hard way to compare that to anything else because, you know, this, this doesn't exist anywhere else in our stuff. Uh, so I, I can't give you a, a comparison, but I can say that, you know, at least in where I was using it to do some, you know, pretty hardcore uh, performance stuff, uh, it keeps up just fine. Awesome, thanks. So actually, let me uh, yeah, take that off the screen, so. Yeah, so it's been, uh, uh, actually, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I, you know, speaking of, you know, the concurrency stuff and performance, I mean, that's one of the things I want to try to do next is find, you know, some, some really, really hardcore concurrent thing to see, you know, see how far I can push it. You know, how many fibers can I really get in here and actually, um, you know, not run into any problems. Yeah, another application that, uh, I mean, I see as a, a data engineer in my day-to-day -day is like, uh, with uh, Scala Spark and, and having Zio manage like the fault tolerance in, in the tasks that they have to distribute between executors. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to, to do uh, concurrent programming and get it right. right. And I prove that every time I try to do it. I, I, just a few days ago, trying to go back and, and you know, debug some concurrent stuff that I wrote not that long ago. I have absolutely no excuse for doing it as poorly as I did. Uh, it's it's hard. It, it, it's really hard. So something like this, I think, really helps. All right, I got to split. Right. Once again, awesome job. Yeah. That was really All right. Thank good. you. Yeah, thanks Andy, for joining. You're on, a roll. you're on a roll, Andy. Case has been killing it lately, so <laughs> Thank <you> very much. <laughs> it's it's not it's very little of it's me. It's a, <laughs> a, 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 a so. Thank you. See you guys. All right, thanks. Nice job. Mark. That was a great presentation. All right, thank you. Talk to you later. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for, thanks for joining. All right. Thanks. See you guys. Appreciate everybody coming out.
Yeah, thanks again, Mark. I always appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's fun. I, yeah. I think I counted right. I think this is eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I uh, like, oh, I did that talk in this. And I, was, I think I was having most <laughs> of the talks you brought up, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, uh, I, I think the first one I did was like seven or eight years ago. So I, I think I'm doing about one a year. So I, I think that's about how long it takes for me to forget how hard these things are. <laughs> and then I said, oh, yeah, I better yeah, it'd be fun to do that. So. Well, I'll reach out so to anyway. you about uh, <laughs> September 2021. <then. laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Yep. Right, thank Bye. you for the presentation.